Mary Lou Jepson is the founder of Open Water, um, where she is developing an optoelectronics-based wearable that can give you the functionality of MRI on your wrist. Um, it has implications for cancer, uh, heart disease, neurodegenerative disease, and many other applications. And uh, I can't wait to hear about it today. Um, as, as we know, she was previously the ec executive director of engineering at Facebook and Oculus, the head of the, head of the display division at Google X, um, the co-founder of One Laptop Per Child, a professor at the MIT Media Lab, um, and the CTO of the display division at Intel. Welcome, Mary Lou. Thank you. I hate to be between you and your lunch, so thank you. I will try to go fast and catch up time. Uh, I quit my job last year, and I had a really good job. I was working at Facebook, and I loved what I was doing. I was sort of doing the march to how to get to sunglasses, VR, AR, as soon as possible to make Mark Zuckerberg happy, <laughs> and uh, was doing a great job. But while I was there, I had an insight that was, I thought was even bigger, and there was nobody that I could find that was really working on it. So I quit and I started, actually, uh, uh, an old friend of mine, a very famous rock star, Peter Gabriel, called me every week for six months trying to convince me to quit and he named the company, it's called Open Water. And so now I'm independent and I really believe it's important to lower the cost of medical care. People are dying, I nearly died 21 years ago, 22 years ago now, when I was a PhD student at Brown University in physics, I was really sick, no one could figure out what I had, and uh, I filled out the paperwork to drop out of college because no one could figure out what I had, and to go home and die. And then on the student health care at that time, pre-Obamacare, uh, I guess we're going back to that here in the US, um, somebody, sprung for the cost of an MRI. They found the brain tumor. A month later, I was back in school. Six months later, I finished my PhD. And with two other graduate students, one who's speaking tomorrow, Philip Alvelda, we started our first startup called Microdisplay. But I never forgot this because I have to take pills every day to live. And so I try to focus on, on how we can have the most impact. And I hope Speaking to all of you today, you have so many skills. I hope you're in the jobs that are enabling you to have the most impact. And the fundamental insight I had is something people have known for a long time. Your body is translucent to near infrared light. It's opaque to visible light, like the, the light that our eyes are sensitive makes our bodies look solid and opaque, but it's translucent to near infrared light, and that's been used for, for blood detection, those things you wear in the hospital to see the oxygen flow, some of the things that we heard about this morning from MC10, and you can see veins and arteries. The light is scattered by the body, but my insight is everybody thinks scattering is random. And that's part of your answer. It's, it's not, it's predictable and reversible, and I'm gonna show you how. So here's what's happening in the physics. We have a bunch of light hitting a scattering material. Imagine that's my bad drawing of the arm from the previous slide. And the light is invisible, it's infrared. I'm color coding it so we can see what happens to each ray as it goes through, but it's all infrared, heat essentially. So the light goes through and it gets bounced around by the scattering material of the arm. It bounces and bounces and some light gets to the detector faster than others. It's not that the speed of light is different, the speed of light is constant. It's just the path length through the material is less ricocheted around. And so that, that orange ray, for example, that's called, they call that the ballistic light, the light that goes through fast. And a lot of the systems that measure the diffuse scattering of infrared light in the body use a principle of a very, very fast detector to measure the ballistic light. They throw away more than 99% of the light, the rest of the light that gets to that detector more slowly, but they can get a good crisp image because the light isn't scattered. The secret to getting a really good crisp image is don't let the light scatter. So that's why we use x-rays, that's why we use MRI, that's why we use other things. You can't do it with the scattering material. You need a super fast, super cooled, 
picosecond detector to be able to differentiate the speed of light at that distance level. So those are expensive and they're noisy. And so it's hard to get a good image, especially when you're throwing away 99% of the light. Yet with this system a couple years ago, a group at Washington University in St. Louis matched the resolution of functional magnetic resonance imaging. It was a big fiber optic Facebook. I visited them. They now have slimmed it down a little bit. But what they showed is with an optical system that could match the resolution of, of MRI. And I was just blown away. I looked at this and I thought, OK, these guys don't know that much about consumer electronics. I've shipped a lot, billions of dollars worth of consumer electronics. This isn't consumer electronics. This is physics. This is awesome. And uh, I went and visited them and hang out with them and, and talk to them and, and the many other people working in, in what's called diffuse optical tomography. Diffuse meaning the light scatters, optical meaning this optics, tomography meaning you get, get, get 3D from it. So, What's happening in MRI evolution is, you know, magnets aren't getting that much better. They get a little bit better every year. You know, it honestly, people joke it takes, and some of my best friends are, out, are Apple, it takes Apple five years to do anything, but it comes out and it's beautiful and everybody wants it. Um, some of the makers of MRI machines are accused, rightly or wrongly, of the same thing. The, the cycle of innovation is slow. The number of units that shipped is maybe 2,000, 3,000 a year. And we can mix this up a lot if we, take a, if we take this optical principle and roll it into the consumer electronics manufacturing factories and the processes that are in high volume mass production to enable a lot more of these at a lot lower cost. Not a multi-million dollar system, but a consumer electronic system with a resolution of MRI that's a wearable. So the principle of this, my insight, had to do with holography. That's how I happened to start life and got into tech. I made my first hologram and that was it. I knew what I was doing for the rest of my life. Holography records the amplitude and phase of light. So what that means is phase like phase, phase is like phase of an ocean wave, the peaks and valleys of something. And by amplitude, it's like how big the waves are, which are, they're big today. I think a lot of people had trouble getting here. It was raining and flooding where I was. So the thing that holography does is you create in the optics a kind of standing wave structure. And a standing wave is a lot like when you pluck a guitar string and you see the vibrations. That's what, what we do to create holograms. And with this, we can record the amplitude and phase, the full wavefront of all of the light that reflects off of or transmits through an object all at once instantly. Now, imagine that object is the scattering of your arm or your brain. We can record it exactly. And then there's this other thing we can do with holography which is called phase conjugation. We invert the phase and so we can neutralize that object. We can basically render the scattering of our bodies to make the body transparent so we can then look for absorption of things, fluorescence of things, and so forth. We can make it work to read things or to write things. So there's a lot of implications. <clears throat> So what about this holography stuff? As I mentioned, I started life as a holographer. And in 1989, as a grad student at the MIT Media Lab, I, with a team of graduate students, built the world's first fully computer-generated holographic video system. We need video in this, because if we record a static image of that scatterer, well, you all know your body moves, right? The blood moves, you're breathing. So we have to do this constantly. We have to compute measure the hologram, compute the phase conjugate, and display it. So we created this system as grad students. I got a master's degree for it. Uh, in 1989, using a connection machine, too, and my handmade one micron pixels that were necessary, because you really need pixels on the order of the wavelength of light to, to make holograms. But if we fast forward to now, 2017, computers, faster, a lot faster, uh, and uh, pixel sizes are a lot smaller. First to enable the smartphone revolution where we could read our emails in gorgeous high resolution on our smartphones, and then that technology in turn has been appropriated by the burgeoning virtual reality and augmented reality field. This is a product I, I shipped when I was with Oculus. It's called uh, the Oculus headset. 
but there, there are others. And what's happening in the VR space is really interesting how it hits here. When you put on a VR headset, what looked like a crisp image on your cell phone now looks chunky. It's not, it doesn't look as crisp, it looks very pixelated. It looks like a 1990s monitor. That's because you're spreading the pixels over your whole field of view. So there's this demand for more pixels and smaller pixels by the VR and AR industry, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, you know, things you wear that you experience other worlds. They all need it. And so the manufacturers have responded with better manufacturing processes. So what I'm doing at Open Water is using those manufacturing processes for different types of chips that can display holograms, not with the right contrast ratio or grayscale. Those aren't important. What's important is spatial frequency. It doesn't matter if you've got a bad pixel. What matters is how we encode those holograms. So custom, custom screens with some embedded processing to compute the phase conjugate um, in the very factories that have been upgraded for the VRAR push. So that's uh, what I'm trying to do. So let me show you sort of what happens then. Computed holographic LCD. So we record the hologram, compute the phase conjugate. The light comes in again to the hologram. It gets mixed up a little bit. So we can focus it down to a single voxel. All of a sudden, all of the light over various times goes to that voxel and then it goes to the detector. We, don't, we no longer need a picosecond detector. We can use a standard detector. And by the way, in all of your cell phones, the standard chips, chip, pixel size in a cell phone detector right now, a camera, is 1.1 microns, which is approximately the wavelength of light of the near infrared. So you're there recording the wavelength with existing parts. Now we're putting the detectors into the LCD and all in one one, but I'm just trying to show you these processes are in high volume mass production now. So this allows us to look voxel by voxel, for example, of oxygenated blood flow. When oxygen comes off of the blood, the color of the ch blood changes a little bit and we know where oxygen is being used. So we can see by measuring voxel by voxel what the blood flow is every cubic millimeter of the brain, which is exactly what functional magnetic resonance imaging does, but we're doing it with just an LCD and a detector and an IR light. So just to be clear, you know, we're talking about replacing something Oh, this is a pretty big room, about a quarter of the size of this room with all kinds of magnetic shielding around it with a consumer electronics wearable made with highly customized LCD chips, detectors, and infrared illumination, and a lot of computing, right, and, and AI. So basically, you know, to take this further, what we're talking about is lining the inside of a ski hat with a flexible LCD wrap around and detector system or a bandage so you can wrap it around your body. That's our goal. We've got some lab prototypes now. We'll have you know, prototypes that we're gonna give to people this year um, in some a very limited number. But all of this sounds so impossible and I just wanna point out it leverages the tools of our time, right? computing, big data, data centers, and consumer electronics, the often ignored consumer electronics. It's come to people designing the consumer electronics of, of my world uh, are, are really focused on, on the styling of the housing and the user interface. They're very important. But we're also at a moment where the manufacturers are hungry. A lot of the companies making smartphones, for example, that have been their uh, you know, big, big sellers for the past few years, their revenues and their valuations are down in half from what they were 18 months ago. So the industry is hungry right now for what's next, and I think this could be part of it. So what I'm talking about is you know, fMRI or this, we can get to one foot of resolution. Theoretically, we can get even further. I've got in my lab demos of that from a few millimeters to submillimeter 
consumer electronics pricing in volume, the first ones will be more expensive, and in a wearable format. And this really changes what we can do for healthcare, particularly for brain disease, which a billion people live with debilitating brain disease between neurodegenerative disease and mental disease, and having continuous monitoring could enable us to better treat them and ultimately cure them. Another application of this is mammography. We know MRI is a better diagnostic for breast cancer, which kills a half a million people each year, but we don't use it, not just in the US that has the most expensive healthcare per person, but even in countries that are perceived arguably to be more efficient in the use. We don't use it because it's too expensive. So it matters what it costs. Even though in, say, Japan and the US, there's 40, 40 MRI machines per 100,000 people, you get to Mexico, there's two MRI machines per 100,000 people. You get to a typical African country, there's one in the capital, if you're lucky. So we really can save a lot of people. So here's something. I, I met uh, the head of a large European mental, the former head of a large European Mental Health Agency, and he said the moment we have this ski cap, he's issuing it to every patient in that country who has clinical depression. And I thought, whoa, why? What about privacy? And he said, nope, uh, doctor-patient confidentiality, confidentiality, we're set. And he explained to me that people don't, a million people kill themselves every year. Really, a million people. And they don't kill themselves, the clinically depressed, when they're at rock bottom. They kill themselves when they're coming out of it in a nonlinear way based on their therapy. And if we can monitor that more closely, it's the belief of people that know far more about this than I, uh, that we could give them far, far better care and keep them safe through that period and get them healthy. And then, of course, there's the neurodegenerative disease and, and onward. But there's more. The reason I, I really wanted to do this, there's a lot of healthcare applications, but I, telepathy is, is really the big deal. And so let me tell you about this experiment done in MRI machines over at Berkeley by Jack Gallant, Professor Jack Gallant and his lab. And in this experiment, which is now about five years old, he took graduate students, maybe postdocs too, and laid them in MRI, fMRI machines for hundreds of hours while they watched YouTube videos. And recordings of their minds reacting to the YouTube videos were made. And then, new image, then a new image sequence was shown, this one. And the computer, using just the brain scan data, guessed what it thought the subjects were looking at. It's grainy, but it's getting close. This shows that we can use imaging and big data and, and analytics to pull images out of our head because when I'm looking at an image versus thinking of an image, the same areas light up under fMRI, which is measuring oxygenated blood flow, which is what this system does with LCDs and detectors. So part of the reason I spun out of Facebook was I thought it was important to talk about this as I was doing it because there are ethical considerations as you, can think, of, as you think of the implications of privacy in your thoughts. If I throw you in an MRI machine, I can tell you what words you're about to say, you what pictures are in your head, you what images are in your, in your head, whether you're listening to me or not, and on and on. And so the, I thought it was important to do that. And there's, there's, there's more. For example, when we render the, the mind basically transparent by inverting the scattering with a hologram, we can then see the differential scattering of the neurons themselves because when there's a voltage change on the neuron, the membrane of the neuron roughens, that scatters light. So we can look for that heartbeat of the differential scattering of light, which can enable us access directly to the neurons. So, you know, here's, here's an example of uh, the light focus, oops, oops, sorry, oops, <laughs> sorry, um, of the light focusing down and the differential scattering. So we just put pixels in our detector and we can see the scattering change. But we can also add in optogenetics or fluorescent materials and look at writing certain areas selectively. So we can 
right areas of tumor or areas one wants to ablate or, you know, this is all future going stuff. To be clear, the product isn't ready. We're in physics prototypes, just to be clear. But this is directionally where we're exploring in terms of what, what we can do. Reading and writing thoughts might be possible. And where does that make sense to do it and where doesn't it? So again, that's why I'm talking about it so early because, oh, and then, you know, we're not the only thing with brains on the planet. <laughs> This octopus is never going to get to school, go, go to school. But um, you know, the implications. We know that dogs can smell cancer and rats and landmines and so forth. The implication is uh, maybe we'd start collaborating with animals more and stop eating them. <laughs> maybe. And then finally, I think the big, the really big idea is this can help people with neurodegenerative disease like Stephen Hawking and others, but on some level, we're all Stephen Hawking in that we're limited in the output of our brains by how fast or how thoughtful our mouths can move or our fingers can type or we can draw or I guess dancing as expression. We're limited. What if we could communicate at the speed of thought? What would we be capable of? Everybody talks about AI taking all of our jobs. And back when that first happened, when Marvin Minsky and Doug Engelbart were talking about it in the 50s, Doug Engelbart Im immediately said, I want to do not AI, I want to do IA. How do we make people smarter? So <laughs> it's an arms race. But you know, our, our creativity, we could dump out much more quickly with this kind of, kind of work. So prototypes this year. Thank you, Lisa, for organizing and inviting me to this conference, and I think it's time for lunch. <laughs>